Good morning, church. If you have your Bibles, go to 1 Corinthians 15. And thank you, worship team, for leading us this morning. Every song that we just sang reiterates what we're about to read. It's all about the gospel. It's all about the salvation that we experience through the grace of Jesus dying on the cross, being raised again on the third day. And that's what we get to celebrate this morning as we read uh, verses 1 to 15. And I want to thank uh, Chris Gorman and Tom Thompson and Pastor PJ for sharing God's word the last number of weeks while I've been out kind of being ill. And uh, what an amazing gift that we have as a church, that we have men in our church that can rise up and preach God's word effectively and stay in the scripture correctly. We are a blessed church. And I'm going to do my best because now you guys are used to about 25 to 30 minutes of a sermon length that I have, uh, maybe I can fall within that range, or we could just get back to the way it used to be and go a little bit 45 minute range. But um, we are almost done, First Corinthians, and in February we are going to start going through the book of Proverbs together. But let me pray, give credit where credit's due, and allow the Holy Spirit to just unveil and open up new insights of God's word that maybe we've never read before. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, and we just ask God for your clarity. Give us divine wisdom. We do not want to seek the wisdom of man. We want to seek the wisdom of you. And so, God, I pray that your page will breathe life into our hearts, that the words will jump out and really hit home to what it means to receive the gospel, to stand on the gospel, to hold fast to the gospel, but to even really know what the gospel is so that when we are called to present this to people in our life that you've placed in front of us, that we will be able to give an account. God, I pray for those that are Christ followers in here this morning. Help them not to be comfortable. Help them not to be chair warmers. Help them not to be in neutral, but help get them activated to spread your gospel. And I pray for those in here that maybe don't know what the gospel is. I pray today that they will receive it and know it and understand it and help it breathe life into them. In Christ's name, amen. So I'm reading out of the English Standard Version, and we're going to be going through a lot of verses this morning. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to read all of them, but when it does pop up, I want you to write them down so that you can take those scriptures throughout the week in your study time and reread them so it helps breathe a little bit more light to the scenario. But if the Holy Spirit stops you on a few words or phrases, feel free to underline that because that's God trying to alert something in your heart. But there's two words that I'm going to have you circle this morning, and when we get there, I'll I'll tell you. It says this, Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if, I want you to circle the word if, you hold fast to the word I preached to you. Unless, I want you to circle the word unless, you believed in vain. For I delivered to you of first importance that I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, put Peter's name there, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. Underline the whole verse of 10. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is in me, whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. And this is what we get to go through this morning and unpack. So number one on your notes is three words, receive, stand, and hold fast. It's more than three words, but it's three statements. Receive, stand, and hold fast. That's what we need to do as Christ followers. In 1 Corinthians 15, it's the oldest of all the testimonies of Jesus' resurrection by, among many witnesses, the Apostle Paul. 
Writing this letter to the church in Corinth in AD 54, Paul identifies first Simon Peter, Cephas, as among the first that Jesus, the resurrected Christ, appeared to. And the reason why he did this is because people were still kind of skeptical of Paul's message. Even after 15 verses in a letter, people were still skeptical of Paul. Then, to verse 1, he says, Now I remind you, therefore, brothers, of the gospel that I preach to you. So what Paul is doing is he started off his letter by confirming the preaching of the gospel, and now he's coming full circle after all the drama that this church was dealing with, trying to remind them of why they are a church. So let me remind you, church, why we are a church. It's because the gospel of Christ Not because we all get along, not because there's no sin in this room, but because of the gospel. And we got to get back to that. And in verses 3 and 4, Paul lays out what the gospel is. Paul will describe the content of the gospel in very succinct detail. And this is important for us to write down as we are called as Christ followers to spread the gospel. We don't get a pass once we believe in the gospel to just hold on to it for ourselves. God actually wants us to spread it. But I'm not going to assume that everybody in here knows what the gospel is. Or maybe even if you were raised hearing versions of the gospel, let's get down to the brass tacks of what it is and not some other form of the gospel. It's hard to spread something that we don't know. And so it's important to relook at it so that we are well versed in what it is. Here, Paul describes how the gospel can be a benefit to man. However, the gospel is only a benefit to man if he has received it and will stand on it. And so what he's doing to the church in Corinth is going, brothers, sisters, I'm glad you've received the gospel and that you are standing on the gospel. I praise the Lord for that. So what Paul is doing is he wants to make sure that the church doesn't miss out on the good news of the gospel. And the reason why we as a church call it the gospel, the good news, is because we are saved from the punishment that we deserved from God because of what Jesus did for us. Jesus took the place on the cross because we wouldn't have been able to handle it. And that is why it is good news. Because I don't have to hang on a cross and nor do you. And I'll describe the cross here in just a few minutes. But what we have read so far in this book of the Bible is that the Corinthian church first received the gospel. And the message of the gospel must first be believed and embraced. Now, the reason why this is important is Paul even told the church in Thessalonica, in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13, he said this to that church, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing. Because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it in, not as the word for man, but as it is in the truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. So this is good news because then the Corinthians also stood for the gospel. And despite all of their problems with carnality, with their lack of understanding, with the strife and the divisions they brought in, and the gossip and the slander and the immorality and the weird spirituality they had, they still stood on the gospel. That should give us hope in here that we have in the gospel because we too don't have it all together. Because if we did, we would all be singing Kumbaya together. But we don't. So it's good that we have hope in this that we've received the gospel, and that we still stand on the gospel even in the midst of our imperfections. This also should give us an understanding if you remember the church in Galatia. See, Paul wrote a letter to the church in Galatia, and what he said in Galatians 1.6 is that the church of Galatia received the gospel, but they abandoned the gospel by not standing on the gospel, which meant is they moved to another gospel, a perverted gospel, a watered-down gospel. And guess what? Those perverted, watered-down gospels are constantly being pushed on us, even in our current state. And if we don't know the firm foundation of the gospel, you're going to be waving back and forth, being tossed in the sea. 
And this is why Paul is so firm on this. Then he goes on in verse 2. And he says, And by which you are being saved, if, and I had you circle the word if, you hold fast to the word that I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So Paul is even pushing the church even further. He's saying, look, church, I'm very thankful that you've prayed a prayer and received the gospel. And I'm even encouraged that you're still standing on the gospel, even in the midst of the mess. But you're only still being saved if you hold fast to the gospel. And I got to tell you, church, this is where a lot of Christians tap out. Church in Galatia tapped out on the second one. And, and we've got to go beyond the first one because Scripture even says that even demons believe that Jesus is who he was. So it's got to go more than belief. It's got to go more than just praying a cute prayer. It's got to go more than just standing on it. And Paul is getting to it. He's going, you've got to hold fast to the gospel. So we're left to assume the Corinthians are still in a fairly well spot of the gospel receiving and standing but that they would continue to do well by holding fast to the gospel. Now, if you took holding fast through the Greek, it's kateko. And if you want to write this down, it's really important. This Greek word, holding fast, means to keep, to possess, to retain, to seize on, and to stay planted in. In other words, what Paul is trying to get to the church is he's talking about sanctification. Now, I know sanctification is a big Christianese word, so let me try to bring it down in layman's terms. Sanctification basically is stating that because we've received and because we've hold fasted to the, uh, 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 or, or, or stood on the fact that Jesus died for our sins and was resurrected, we now continue to walk through Christ's likeness daily. So, Paul is making a point that every Christian needs to take seriously their responsibility of not only the good past and good present, but to determine to have a great future for the Lord too. So what he's doing to the church here is he's going, there's three steps to a Christ-following life. And the first step is receive the gospel. The second step is to stand on the gospel. And finally, the third, hold fast to the gospel, being sanctified by the gospel. Now, unfortunately, this is where people tap out. Because sanctification, holding fast to the gospel, takes work. It takes work. It's actually very uncomfortable. Because the Holy Spirit isn't done with you. Which means the Holy Spirit, until the day you die and meet Jesus face to face, will not be done with you. Which means he kind of want to get he wants to get in to your life. He wants to challenge you politically. He wants to challenge you emotionally. He wants to challenge you spiritually. He wants to challenge you in how you relate to your spouse. He wants to challenge you in how you treat your children. He wants to challenge you in your employer employee work relationship. In fact, he wants to go so much into sanctification and Christ's likeness that he wants to bring out the toxins of your soul. That he wants to bring out the hidden areas, the sins, the closets that no one knows anything about. That's what sanctification is. The things that grip us and rob us from Christ's likeness, that's what sanctification is. And this is why Christians go, mm, I'll believe <coughs> and I'll even hold fast or I'll stand on it, but I don't want to hold fast on it. Or we make a little precursor with Christ. We go, okay, Jesus, I'm willing to hold fast with you as long as you function within the boundary of what I think you should do. Meaning, if, if I get to go make my own decisions, then I will hold fast to your gospel. But if you are going to make me uncomfortable, I'm not so sure I want to be a Christ follower right now in this moment. And this is why Paul said, look, and by which you are being saved, if, if, if is a big word, if you hold fast, 
if you continue to walk through sanctification to be more like Christ. Unless you believed in vain. Family, I grew up believing in Jesus and at times standing on the gospel. But I abandoned it because I believed it in vain. Now, holding fast is not a coasting life. It's not a comfortable life. It's not a, I get to sit on a Sunday morning in a chair and not get activated. It's not being able to keep the spiritual car in neutral. I'll tell you right now, the Holy Spirit is going to flip your car over. He wants you to put it in gear. He wants you to walk through sanctification. And I know it's not popular. In our culture, it's not popular. And quite frankly, in moments of my own weakness, I don't like it. And if any of you can honestly say, I love sanctification, I would kind of question you a little bit because you like it until he hits a hot button. And when he hits that hot button, you're like, oh, we get mad. It's holding on to the very gospel that brought you to salvation. But why? Why is he doing this? Why is Paul reminding the church in Corinth? Is because people in situations are going to want to snatch it away from you. Circumstances and divisiveness in the church and, oh, that person raises their hands, that person doesn't, speaking in tongues, not speaking in tongues, prophecy, non-prophecy, getting married, staying celibate, suing your brother, not suing your brother. All of that is worldly distractions that take us away from the gospel. Not only that, if you're not holding fast to the gospel, there's going to be situations that are going to come your way that give you a watered-down and perverted version of the gospel. And that's what happened in the church in Galatia. And if you're ever in Revelation, that's what talks about to six out of the seven churches in Revelation, in the first part of Revelation. And we, even to this day, have more and more people that are trying to pervert God's gospel to give you some watered-down, phony version of it. Like, I'll give you one, just a little tidbit. Everyone gets to go to heaven. I mean, that's cute. That sounds beautiful. That means I get to do whatever the heck I want to do because I'm, I got my, my ticket has been punched. I'm going to go to heaven anyway. That's a perverted gospel that is not biblical at all. But it's to make people feel comfortable because the last thing we want to do is talk about a judgment from God. But I'll tell you right now, through the judgment of God and His mercy, it's very loving when He actually sent His Son to die for you and for me. To bring us back to a holy relationship with Him. So, yes, perverted gospels, distractions, all this stuff is going to be thrust upon you. Let's just take the last two years. Fear is going to, to bubble up and, and try to destroy you rather than holding fast to what the Word of God says. And i got to be honest with you, if you go back two years when certain things bubbled up, I won't even mention what it is. It was like, what do we do as a church? I guess we shut down. And I look at it and I go, whoa, 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 whoa. What does it mean to hold fast? God has laid out Story after story, prophecy after prophecy of what is going to happen in this world. But if you're a Christ follower in here, you already know you're not from this world. We are strangers passing through to get to our final destination. If you go to Romans chapter 12, which, by the way, we went through in, chapter, or in, in 2020, it says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, be transformed by the renewing of her mind. That means don't live your life in fear. Don't continue to listen to other people's interpretations of the gospel. Get back to the source. Paul then tosses out a final caveat into the mix in verse 2. He says, unless, unless you believe in vain. Now, if the Corinthians do not hold fast, then one day they might 
let go the gospel. And if they let go of the gospel, all their previous belief won't do them any good. Why? Because they believed in vain. So that's number one. Number two. So he gets that out of the way. He's trying to give them a three-point challenge. Then in verses 3 and 4, he lays out the content of the gospel. This is beautiful. In verse 3, he says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. Meaning he's received this very gospel that he is once again reminding them that has been preached to them. Paul is saying, look, I didn't make this up. This isn't Paul's gospel. This isn't made from man. This is from Jesus Christ himself. And the reason why he did this is because there were still people doubting Paul. And they thought Paul was making this story up. Well, guess what? Every time we go and share the gospel, there are people that think we make it up. So what do we have left to do? We've got to turn them to the truth of God's word. Don't take my word for it. Let's, let's just search this and read it and go through it. So according to Galatians chapter 1, verse 11 to 12, he says, For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not a man's gospel. So he's very succinct in all his letters. Verse 12, For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught, but I received it through the revelation of Jesus Christ. How did Paul receive the gospel? It wasn't because he met Jesus physically live. Was it that he was there when Jesus died and was resurrected? It wasn't that he was there, the first person that Jesus revealed himself to. No, he met Jesus on the road to Damascus while he was named Saul going to kill Christians. And the Spirit of God knocked him off his horse, and then a new revelation opened up, and it's like God chose him. A man that was butchering Christians, and he's like, I like this guy. I want him. But I want them for me. And I want to use them to go spread my gospel to the nations. What an unlikely character Paul was. What an unlikely character all of us are. That God saw something in each of you to go, I like, I like her. I like him. I want through sanctification to make them more like me. Paul did not create this gospel. He did not fashion this gospel. He did not add or take away from this gospel. In fact, Spurgeon said, we are not makers or inventors of the gospel. We are repeaters. We tell the message that we received. I'll tell you right now, when I received the gospel when I was 18 years old, I didn't take people back to the scriptures I only told them the story about what God did to me when he knocked me down in the midst of my selfishness. All I do is repeat the message. I deliver mail that was already written. So the good news for us spreading the gospel is you don't have to make up anything. It's already here. So look at what Paul does as he lays it out. Letter A, gospel point number one. Christ died. Very important to the gospel. The death of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, is at the very center of the gospel. This is what we believe. This is what we preach. This is what you've received. This is what you stand on. And this is what we hold fast to. It's that Jesus died. The question will come up when you meet somebody and you're telling them about Jesus' death. They'll go, well, how did Jesus die? Now, This might sound trivial because most of us in here probably already know how he died, but I'm not going to assume everybody does. Well, the Roman government executed Jesus by one of the most most cruel and excruciating forms of capital punishment ever devised. It's called crucifixion. It's where you get hung on a cross, left to die. Edwards says this, although the Romans did not invent crucifixion, they perfected it as a form of torture and capital punishment that was designed to produce a slow death with maximum pain and suffering. That's how Jesus died. Well, then somebody might ask, what was it like to be crucified? Well, I don't know, nor do you. We've never been crucified before, but what we do have is a letter that tells us what crucifixion looked like, so we point them to it. I'll tell you what crucifixion was like. 
victims' backs were torn open by scourging. What does this mean? They would rip your clothes and they would start beating you with leather whips. And at each end of the leather whip are fish hooks that every time they would rage into your back, it would rip flesh out. And however many times they whipped you, so now your whole back is exposed. All the inside is coming on the outside. And clotted blood would then once again be ripped open again when they put clothes back on you. They would do that on purpose so that when they took it off, Again, for your crucifixion, it would open you up and expose your wounds. When he was thrown on the ground to be nailed and his hands to a cross beams, the wounds were again torn open again by the wood and contaminated with dirt. Then you would be hung on a cross. With each breath, the painful wounds on your back scraped against the rough wood of the upright beam and were once again activated and aggravated. And when the nail was driven through your wrist, it severed the large nerve. Well, what does that do? It stimulates your nerve produced excruciating bolts of fiery pain in both arms and it would result in a a claw-like grip in the victim's hands. Then beyond that, the major effect of crucifixion was the lack of being able to breathe. And the weight of the body being pulled down on the arms and the shoulders intended to fix the respiratory muscles in the inhalation state, but you wouldn't be able to exhale. Death from this form of punishment could come from a variety of different ways, such as acute blood loss, or being too exhausted to breathe any longer, or dehydration, stress-induced heart attack, congestive heart failure, leading to cardiac rupture. And if the victim did not die quickly, they would come, the soldiers would come, and break your legs. Now why am I sharing this? This is an Easter. Why am I sharing this not on an Easter Sunday? Because I'll tell you right now, were you thinking about speaking in tongues while I just presented how he died? Were you thinking about... How you should divorce your spouse? Were you thinking about how to slander your brother? Were you thinking about how to sue your brother and sister? Were you thinking about dividing the church? Absolutely not. Because we got back to the gospel. And what Paul is saying is, look church, Corinth. And I'll say, look church, Christ community. If we focused in on the gospel and allow it to permeate in our heart, we would not have the time to be worried about worldly stuff because God has given us a mission for His glory. It's kind of hard to fight in the church when we bring it back to how our Christ died. Gospel point number two. Why did He die? He died for our sins. If that doesn't break your heart, I don't know what will. What does it mean that Jesus died for our sins? That's the questions people will ask. How does his death do anything for our sin? I mean, many noble men and women have died horrible deaths for righteous causes through the centuries. How does the death of Jesus do anything for my sin? Well, I'm glad you asked those questions. Because we have answers. At some point before Jesus died, before the veil was torn in two, Before he cried out, it was finished. An awesome spiritual transaction took place. God the Father laid upon God the Son all the guilt, all the wrath of our sin and what we deserved. And Jesus bore it on himself perfectly. Look, the reason why I'm tearing up is because I know my sin. And if I add my sin to all your sin, you know the sin that's in the closet? The toxins that no one else knows about? Those sins are exposed on the cross and Jesus bore that. And our church is only 400 people, but imagine all the rest of the world. All the murder, all the rape, all the abortion, all of everything on the cross for our sin. Thousands upon thousands of years. Yet totally satisfying the wrath of God in our place. No one else has ever died that way. No noble person has ever taken the weight of my sin and died that way. Only Christ. And as horrible as the act of suffering His death endured, the spiritual suffering was Him being judged for our sin in our place. And this is why we take communion. When we get to the cup, this is what the cup symbolizes. 
This cup was so vast. This cup was so heavy that even Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane was troubled by it and didn't want to drink from it. And you can read that. Luke 22, Psalm 75, Isaiah 51. But he did. And on the cross, Jesus became, as it were, an enemy of God who was judged and forced to drink from that cup of the Father's fury so we would not have to drink that cup. And because none of us would, and I guarantee you none of us could have. In fact, as it says in the Scriptures, what he says, Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scripture. Well, let's go back to what the Scripture says. Go to Isaiah. Isaiah 53. 3 to 5. This was thousands of years before. This put, it puts it powerfully. He was despised and rejected by man. A man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. How in the world could Jesus have come to die for the sins of humanity if it wasn't already foretold in the Old Testament. Clark says this, he goes, Reader, listen, one drop of this cup would bear down thy soul to endless ruin. And the agonies would annihilate the universe. He suffered alone. For the people there was none with him because his sufferings were to make an atonement for our sin of the world. And in the work of redemption, he had no helper. Jesus had to take this alone. So first gospel point is Jesus died. Gospel point number two is he died for our sin. Gospel point number three, he was buried. Now the burial of Jesus doesn't get a whole lot of play. And we don't think, hey, how does the burial of Jesus have anything to do with the gospel? The burial of Jesus is important for several reasons. The first is it's proof positive that he really died. You don't bury somebody if they're not dead. And Jesus' death was confirmed on the cross before he was taken down to be buried. You can read about that in John 19, 31 to 37. The second reason why Jesus' burial is also important, because it was fulfilled by the Scriptures. Look at what he says. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance to the Scriptures. What does the Scriptures say? Isaiah 53, 9. It says, And they made his grace with the wicked, but the rich at his death. What does that even mean? Well, guess what? Jesus was buried in a rich man's tomb. And it was prophesied in Isaiah 53, 9. And it came to fruition when Jesus was buried in the tomb of a rich man. And you can read about that in Matthew 27. So, gospel point number one, Jesus died. Gospel point number two, Jesus died for your sins. Gospel point number three is he was buried. Gospel point number four, and this is why we all rejoice, is he rose again. This is truth is essential to the gospel. If Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins and remove our guilt, then why is the resurrection of Jesus so important? Well, although Jesus bore the full wrath of God on the cross, as if he were the guilty sinner, guilty of all our sin, even being made for us, or sin for us in 2 Corinthians 5.21, as that is what's been prophesied, he himself did not become a sinner. Jesus never sinned. He carried the weight of the world's sin, but he didn't sin. That's why he's God. Every act of taking our sin was an act of holy giving love for us. That's how we know we serve a loving God is because he rescued you from sin. Why? Because scripture says for the wages of sin leads to death. If we didn't have Jesus on the cross, we would all be dead. And this is the essential gospel message. That Jesus took our punishment for sin on the cross and remained a perfect Savior through the whole ordeal. And for this reason and this reason only, he remained the Holy One, as declared in Acts chapter 2, 27. Even in his death, he was holy. Therefore, the resurrection of Jesus is not some add-on or more important work of the cross. If the cross is the payment for our sin, the empty tomb is our receipt, showing that the perfect Son of God made perfect payment for our sins. 
Sin was defeated, but nothing positive was put into place until he was resurrected. And the resurrection shows us that Jesus did not succumb to the inevitable result of sin. So, gospel point number one, Jesus died. Gospel point number two, Jesus died for our sin. Gospel point number three, he was buried. Gospel point number four, he was resurrected. But James, why are you preaching the Easter message in January? Look, just because we preach the Easter message on Easter does not mean that we need to forget the Easter message all year long. Finally, gospel point number five. He says, according to the Scriptures. That's important, family. Because the idea and claim that Paul is so important to remind the church, he repeats it twice in these verses. Jesus' work for us didn't come out of thin air. It was planned from all eternity and described prophetically in all the scriptures. You could go all the way back to Genesis. Read throughout the entire Bible and see Christophanes, Christ, all throughout. It's because God had a plan for your life. And it's more than a prayer. It's more than just belief. It's more than just standing on it. It's holding fast in the midst of of the evil that we live in. The plan for Jesus' resurrection was described in Hosea 6.2, Jonah 1.17, Psalm 16.10, among many others. All right, so now that he talks about standing, talks about receiving and holding fast, lays out the gospel, we get to our final point, number three, verses five through eight. The evidence is so concrete. And I don't need to read the book, Evidence Demands a Verdict. I don't need to get up here with the chart like I've done before. Don't have to do that. And neither did Paul. Because he already knew, Paul already knew that there were people that didn't believe him. So what does he do? He goes through the history of who Jesus showed himself to, the resurrected Christ. He goes through the list of those that profess this and could give testimony. Paul does this to establish beyond all controversy that Jesus truly was raised from the dead. And he starts off by saying, Jesus showed himself to Cephas. Cephas was Peter. Showed himself to Peter first. Then, oh, in Luke chapter 24, 34. Then he goes to the 12. Mark chapter 16, 14. Luke 24, 36. John 20, 19, if you want to read that. Then, he appeared to over 500 people at once. Matthew 28, 10. Matthew 28, 16 to 17. And then he says, of whom they're still alive. So he's like, look, you don't believe me. Go back to all the people that are still alive in 54 AD that saw Jesus, the resurrected Christ, that touched his hands. If that's not good enough, he goes on, he says, then he showed himself to James, the brother of Jesus, then by all the apostles, John 20, 26, John 21, 1 through 25. But then he gets to the final, and he says, the last person he showed himself was to me. And this is very interesting if you don't know Paul, and you don't know any of the history. Paul was not there when Christ was crucified. He was not there when he rose again. You want to know why? He was out learning Jewish law only to begin to start killing Christians that believed in this nonsense. Right? To Paul, this was all nonsense. So he didn't see Jesus until he was on the road to Damascus on his way to go persecute Christians. The Holy Spirit met him, transformed his life, and said, you are my chosen one. I love you. And I even forgive you for killing Christians. But I got a job for you, Paul. The funny thing is, how did Paul see himself? The reason why he said these words at the end is because there were still some that doubted, but by Paul's own admission here, Paul was the most unlikeliest of apostles. You are the most unlikeliest of apostles. Me, the most unlikeliest of apostles. I read, I read the final verses in chapter 15, and I understand now what Paul is trying to say. 
I can relate to his message here, not because he considered himself inadequate, but because he tried to destroy God's church by persecuting Christians. Why would God use me? Look, I grew up in the church. If you don't know my testimony, I grew up in a a mega church family. My dad was a pastor, and at 16, I left the church. Why? Because I believed in vain. I heard all the stories. I prayed the prayer when I was a kid about 18 times because I didn't want to go to hell. I prayed it. I believed in it. At times, I, I, I stood on it. But then I became very angry, and I made it my mission from 16 to 18 to destroy the church. I'm like, I'm going to bring down the church and its lies, its hypocrisy. They read scripture. They live differently. I'm going to bring down my dad. I hope he gets fired. I'm just on a mission to destroy the church because I wanted to prove that God was not real. I wanted to prove you could not hear God's voice. And then God met me. And everyone that knew me before I became a Christ follower, that saw me after I met Christ for the first time at 18, were like, you? Jim? The guy that used to do this with us? You are a Christian now? Come on, come party. Come do this with us. No, no, I really don't want to live that way anymore. You, Jim. Absolutely me. And it wasn't because I reread scripture, because I already knew all the verses. I went to Sunday school. I sang all the songs. I had the felt boards. The gospel was never fully in my heart, because I believed in vain. It was because I was writing a paper at a Bible school that I didn't want to be at. And the, in the letter, and the, the, the paper was, how do you hear from God? And I'm sitting there, couldn't wait to destroy this letter, this paper. And I'm like, oh man, I'm going to prove you can't hear from God. And then boom, the Holy Spirit shows up. Knocks me on my face. And I went to a bunch of the guys that I was in school with. And I'm like, I'm ready. And then we get to verse 10, and it just jumps out of nowhere. It says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. God's grace towards Paul was not in vain. Why? Because Paul had a life transformation, and he started going and planting churches. And he started raising leaders, and he started preaching the gospel to all the most unlikely people. The reason why God's grace to me is not in vain is because I couldn't wait. Once I received Christ, I I was like, oh man, I can't wait to go to the hardest of the hard, the, the people that can't wait to kill Christians and destroy the church. And that's who I get really jazzed to go talk to. Because God took an unlikely character like me. And it wasn't in vain. It would be in vain if I sat in church all day and didn't do anything with this faith. So in closing, could you say verse 10 represents you in your life? Could you? And what process of this three thing are you on? Are you in the, I believe... Phase, or are you in the I believe and I stand on it phase? Or are you in the I will hold fast till my dying breath? Could we stand up and say, but by God's grace, I am what I am, that I am here today because of his grace? And that his grace towards me is not in vain. The only way to answer this question is with absolute certainty is by going back to what the gospel is. Have you received that gospel? Are you standing in that gospel? And are you holding fast to that gospel? I'll tell you right now, this gospel is meant to be repeated. And if you have received Christ and have never shared Christ with somebody, that's a scary place to be. And I'm not saying you got to be like Paul and you got to go start planting churches. Maybe that's what God's called you to. But I'm not saying that. But I will tell you this. 
God has you on this planet to save your soul, to have you be a witness to at least one person. Maybe it's your spouse, maybe it's your child, maybe it's your in-laws, maybe it's your parents, maybe it's your coworker, maybe it's your neighbor, whoever it is. But I do believe this, and I believe this with all certainty, that God will literally move you across the world for one person's life. God could have saved me in California, but he moved me all the way to Canada to give me a whole new list of characters because conditions up there were perfect for the Holy Spirit to meet me in my most dysfunctional place. That's how God works. Thank you, Lord, for your gospel. Let's pray. We don't gather at church to gossip, to fight, to divide, to slander, to manipulate. We don't gather in church for any of those reasons. We gather around the gospel of Jesus. That we serve a Messiah that loved us so much that he died for the weight of our sin, was buried and was risen on the third day to free us until we see him face to face for all of eternity. May you walk through the gift of sanctification, the gift of holding fast to God's glory. May he unpack the toxins in your heart. May he make you feel uncomfortable May he mess up your plans so that he can do an absolute work in your life. And maybe some of you in this room are ready for that. If you're ready for a transformational life, may you just pray that now God change me, make me more like you every day. And if you've been sitting as a Christ follower, whether for a year, 15 minutes, or 40 years, and you've kept this gospel to yourself and haven't shared it, may this be the day that you begin to start seeing the people that God places in your life for a reason. And that maybe, just maybe, He will cultivate a perfect condition a perfect situation where you're able to share about your transformational story with somebody. And may it not be weird. May it not be awkward. Don't just go hand a track and walk away. May it be a time where the relationship is being built because God wants to use you in that person's life. Because you're here today Because God used somebody in your life. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Help us not to be like the church in Corinth where we are blinded by our circumstances and our culture. But help us to get back to the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.